Hello, I'm Howard Stableford. Welcome to this week's edition of Concept Cars. So far this series, we've looked at the wide variety of new ideas and systems from some of the world's top designers. This week, we meet the designers of the future. London's Royal College of Art and Coventry University are world-renowned for training up excellent future car designers, so we took a visit to look at some of the students' latest concept cars. Here's the first problem the students at Coventry needed to solve. Cities are becoming more and more congested, leading to business inefficiency and general frustration for all. Plus, when you've battled your way through the jams with your car, you then have to stump up an arm and a leg to park the flipping thing all day. If public transport doesn't go your way when you need it to, a car of your own is the only option. Or is it? Thomas has come up with a workable alternative to private vehicle ownership. This is basically the solution to private vehicle ownership. Um, the way I see it, in the future, with the legislation and the inner city travel, uh, private vehicle ownership is not going to be uh, the end thing anymore. Uh, it's going to be very expensive, um, very uh, misinformed, I'd say. Uh, public transport isn't the best answer to this problem. Uh, people like their own personal space, and let's admit it, you know, public transport doesn't get you where you want to get, when you want to get there. He's right, of course. And have you ever tried to take four bags of shopping, two small children, a pushchair and a stuffed alligator on a bus journey? Exactly. So Thomas's concept is this car. He calls OB, as in object, which comes wrapped up in a system of ownership where you can hire cars when you need them from registered mobile phones. But why is this different from normal car hire? The difference is um, these are located in the majority of inner city council owned car parks. Uh, the council owns, runs and maintains these vehicles. So they're within walking distance of the majority of families, either out of city or inner city. They're also located near schools and hospitals uh, and most of the majority of supermarkets where there is substantial room. A good idea so far. So what would a typical hire be? The wife and a child wakes up in the morning, the child wants to get to school. Um, the mother doesn't really want the child to catch the bus because you know, it's not really old enough. A bit worried about him, so off they pop. She uh, phones up on a mobile phone, um, allocates the time, uh, is given back a code. She goes straight to the vehicle, is able to hire the vehicle, or rent the vehicle for a, a set period of time, however long it takes her to drive the child to school and drive back again. If she wants, she can stop off at the supermarket on the way back or the garden centre and make the most of her rental period. The cars are located on quad pods, which are pods that hold four vehicles. They're also a central recharging station. And they're all linked via satellite to a central hub located in the city. But surely lazy punters wouldn't bother to plug in to recharge their vehicles after using them, would they? Thomas has thought of this too. When vehicle rental is over, uh, that's signalled by the fact that the user will then plug the car back into the charging point. So it's almost as the onus is on the user to recharge the vehicle. So you always have charged vehicles ready for you. Neat touch. But isn't this OB system very similar to the Citroen concept system called Osmos proposed some years ago? The Citroen Osmosis is a, it's just a giant vehicle. It's uh, used by a single driver who uses it as a, a glorified taxi service. Um, why would a person want to buy their own vehicle to give the lifts to people who just couldn't be bothered to buy their own vehicle? Um, this isn't owned by a single person. It's rented to a number of people and it's also very small. It's in fact 150 millimetres smaller than the smart car, um, but a little bit taller. Uh, due to the inclined seating position, you've got a lot more interior cabin space than the smart car also, and you've got a huge amount of storage in the back. Um, so it's got a very smaller footprint and very good all-round visibility by the glass in the vehicle. The OB may be a workable and practical city-based care-share system, but it's not exactly the fun side of motoring, is it? These days we have the choice of a wide range of thrill machines, from roadsters to cabriolets to out-and-out -out power vehicles. But, according to Swede Linda Anderson, the future will accentuate the need for a different type of motoring thrill. In the future, I believe the public transport is going to be developed. And I think um, yeah, more the personal transportation is going to belong in the area of entertainment. And, uh, yeah, so my, this vehicle is about uh, the excitement of driving. The name of this project is Shuhu, and uh, that's a Swedish word for something very exciting and fun, and like the English word chiha or something like that. And um, it's, it's a project about uh, the excitement of driving. 
And because I believe in the future, I think the public transport is going to be developed. And uh, but I, I think we still need ve uh, yeah, vehicles for people's emotional needs. So Linda did a load of research and came up with this sexy looking part car, part hovercraft. Yeah, the technolo technology around this project is based upon hovercraft. Uh, but to facilitate the steering, it's got two wheels in the front. Uh, so you actually break one wheel and the vehicle turns. And um, yeah, I was, I was doing my research, I was looking into different kind of vehicles to, and I was driving different vehicles to find what is exciting with yeah, motorbikes, uh, cars, to try to, to pick different elements into one. So hovercraft was something, yeah, I tried that as well. And, and it was something really different and, to drive and it was a different feeling of, of driving that. And it's still safe. If you see a motorbike, it's very dangerous. Uh, hovercraft is very safe, but it's very exciting anyway. There's no way a hovercraft could be licensed on public roads, but Linda thinks her car could be a wow on private land and could be the basis of a new kind of sport. Yeehaw! Or as they say in Swedish, Sventastic. This is America, the land of the pickup truck. You wouldn't be surprised to know that the biggest selling vehicle in the States is a pickup, the ubiquitous Ford F-Series. So if they can do so well in North America, why can they only manage to appeal to a few builders and landscape gardeners in Europe? Andy Harrison was determined to work out why cultures so close in many ways could be worlds apart when it comes to buying pickup trucks. Europeans don't like pickups because of the weather. The fact that it's uh, pretty miserable and rainy and I think also Europe being a more uh, smaller, slightly more cramped and uh, close-knit culture and society generally, as opposed to America being quite large and vast, security issues are quite important to consider when you're designing a pickup for Europe. So Andy was keen to overcome this drawback and design a concept pickup for our European tastes. I started designing a pickup for Europe by researching into uh, American pickup trucks and I used that as an influence when designing designing the one for Europe. Um, I looked at how large America was and how the weather systems and the culture and people, how, how they generally, there's a, there's a major cult and trend for buying, for buying American pickup trucks and modifying them and it's a very, much, almost a hobby. Uh, so it's in a way quite domest domesticated as well. Rather than in Europe, all pickups generally are quite commercial. The first thing Andy designed in was a motorised rear bed cover to help security and to protect from the European elements. The rear bed is actually is, is removable. There are plastic panels on top that can be stowed in the sides um, and uh, the rear screens and top glass slides away and folds into the rear, uh, rear parcel shelf and the whole thing is collapsible leaving you a straight through bed which is exactly the same as you'd have on a commercial pickup truck. If you've been to the States, you'll know another reason why the big, beefy pickup is a mainstay of American automotive life. There's so much space. So how could an average pumped-up pickup cope with narrow lanes and tiny European car park spaces? So in order to combat that one, I've uh, pushed all of the occupants inside, inside the vehicle a lot further forward, which has reduced the bonnet length and but maintain the actual overall load space at the back. There are of course some pickups on sale in Europe from manufacturers including Mitsubishi and Ford whose Ranger is a scaled down F-Series. But you know, maybe Andy Harrison's well thought through tweaks could spread pickup fever across Europe just as it has in the States. What is it that makes people choose one car over another? Everyone has different practical needs, but does everything come down to mere functionality? Of course not, as anyone would know when that deep twang of desire wells up as you stare a stylish performance car in the face. Mike Kirtley set out to discover how important functionality and stylishness are for people. I thought it was important to, to judge how people perceive different types of products, so I got them to look at pictures of you know, very functional functional things like Concorde and paper clips and that kind of thing um, and see how they perceive that, the style of that and if they, if they find them attractive, if they find that aesthetic, you know, a, a good thing. And also to contrast that, to look at very stylish things like a Philippe Stark uh, lemon juice, which is very stylized but doesn't necessarily look so functional. It was very interesting to see how they, um, how it varied between 
certain, certain products like, like the juicer that is very stylized and yet it was still perceived as very functional, although in reality it's, it's maybe not as functional as, as it could be. Mike's research discovered that vehicles could be designed between two extremes, those very stylish but low in functionality and those very high in functionality but with questionable styling, like the Fiat Multipla. The Fiat Multipla, I mean, it's, it, it, it's a very functional form, it has a lot of function inside it, and yet it has a very kind of interesting and challenging aesthetic. Um, whether that was deliberate or not, I don't know, but it does, does have a functional feel through its volume and all that kind of things. Uh, Vauxhall Sephira, um, it, it's, got very, it's got very revolutionary seat systems and it offers a lot of diversity, which, you know, that, that helps the user in everyday life. Um, less functional cars is, is a lot more difficult, because I think a car wouldn't make it into production if it wasn't, if it wasn't functional. Um, I guess Lamborghinis and Ferraris are less functional, they, they, they offer less. They, they're much, they're much, more, much more selective in, in what, they, what they achieve. And when it comes to the award-winning Audi TT, the styling and looks are astonishing. But is that practical? My opinion of the, the TT is that, yeah, it, it is lacking in fundamental function because it is very small, two seats. It has back seats, but you know, they're tiny, you can't do anything with them. Um, and yet, it does have that very Bauhaus, very German-looking styling, which, which is functional. It does look functional. It looks like it'll do what it's supposed to do and do it very well. It's a very confident-looking car. Mike's concept car, designed after his research, ended up aimed at Audi. And obviously, being an Audi, it needed to be dynamic. It needed to, to have that special something. They, they are Germanic, but they, they do have that extra something. And proportion was my way of doing that. So the model especially is very, does have exaggerated proportion. Neat machine, but would Audi consider his idea? Currently, they don't have anything of this kind of scale. Um, I'd like to think they'd consider it, but we'll see. Of course, these young people could be the top car designers of the future. And an exhibition like this is often frequented by established stars of automotive creativity. So what do they think of the up-and-coming designers? It's very difficult to assess very quickly when you walk into a design show um, without spending a lot of time. Because um, in, in fact, if I'm being honest, most design shows look very similar and you've actually got to spend some time talking to the people and understanding where they're coming from in terms of the designs rather than just superficially just glancing uh, past. But um, I've noticed that there are, there, are, there are one or two very good people and uh, a couple of people that I've spoken to um, are coming from design in a slightly different perspective which I think is quite is very important. I think there's um, there's a sort of there's a freshness without naivety. That's what's what I really like about this. There's sort of a, there's a sophistication in some of this stuff, which has uh, opened my eyes. Quite frankly, it's really good. It's very good indeed. That's all for part one. But here's a glimpse of some of the concept cars we'll be featuring in part two. Welcome back to part two of Concept Cars. From looking at some of the designs coming out of the international styling houses, you'd think the holy grail of car design was to make the smallest, nippiest city car in the world. But the other end of the scale hasn't been forgotten either. Renault have recently introduced two executive models, and their rivals Peugeot have ignored the poor sales of the 605 and have brought the huge 607 to the market. Even Volkswagen are in the game, pumping up the Passat to limo proportions with their gargantuan fight-on project. But if we were to see the ultimate in executive luxury, wouldn't it come from an established quality brand such as Mercedes? Well, this concept is what's come from their design rooms in their quest for the ultimate limousine ever made. I feel myself finding difficulties in even calling this incredible machine merely a car. I mean, a Fiat Punto's a car, isn't it? But this, this! Even Mercedes themselves realise that this fantastic vehicle is in a class above their own high standards and have relaunched a famous mark from the early 20th century. For this is the mighty Maybach. 
In 1883, Wilhelm Maybach, together with Gottlieb Daimler, developed the first fast-running petrol engine suitable for use in a vehicle. In 1901, he built the Mercedes car, effectively the first modern motor car. And in 1909, he was instrumental in the establishment of the Friedrich Schaffen engine factory. The first Maybach car, the W3, was unveiled at the Berlin Motor Show in 1921 and was immediately the object of enormous interest due to its advanced technology and its huge 12-cylinder engine. Karl Maybach was quick to emphasise even then that he was not aiming to build a people's car. His intention was to produce the most technically advanced car possible and to satisfy the expectations of the most discerning customers. In 1930, the Maybach Zeppelin was unveiled, and boy, this car was as big as a Zeppelin. Of course, it ran on leaded fuel, so I suppose you could call this a lead Zeppelin. Yeah, sorry about that. Well, the German public certainly got themselves dazed and confused because here was a car company, a year after the Wall Street crash, bringing out the world's most expensive car. In fact, with a price tag of 50,000 Reichmarks, the Maybach Zeppelin cost as much as five large family homes. Daimler Chrysler haven't told us yet how much the new Maybach will cost when the car eventually makes it into the showroom. That's if it fits in the showroom. This measures 2.7 metres long. But don't be misled into thinking this is a lumbering beast. This baby sprints to 60 in about 5.4 seconds, thanks to a 550 brake horsepower bi-turbo power plant. It's true to say that the Maybach team have been obsessed with the idea of creating the world's most luxurious and comfortable vehicle, with as much high-end technology installed as their budgets would allow. And their budgets were huge, let me tell you. Rear passengers can recline in absolute luxury while each can enjoy separate Dolby surround systems. There's a four-zone climate control system, for goodness sake, with two separate aircon units. The interior is a work of art as it is. There are over 100 crafted and hand-fitted items of exotic wood trim. There are refrigerated compartments, two cordless phones, DVD, sat-nav. If it's been invented, it's probably on the Maybach. Daimler-Benz claim that the extensive range of standard and optional equipment gives this car's customers a staggering two million ways of equipping their car to satisfy their every whim. Even the floor mats are made of the finest velour. Please wipe your feet before you get in. Another option is the unique panoramic roof which has electro-transparent glass. No more fumbling about with silly blinds. Just click a button and the embedded crystals turn dark. Clever, eh? Plus, for those hot, sweaty dog days, the Maybach has what they call active seat ventilation. It apparently senses just how hot your executive rear is and then wafts cooling air through the seat cushions to ensure you're in top shape for that important board meeting. If that sounds a little trivial, don't worry, they haven't forgotten the important stuff as well. This super executive machine is equipped with the Sensortronic Brake Control System and, count them, 10 airbags. It'll be fascinating to discover just how much this car will retail for when the production version makes its way onto the market in the UK. But there's one thing for sure, if you need to ask how much it is, you can't afford it. In this concept car series, we've featured a lot of fascinating designs. But have you ever thought where car designers actually work? Like true artists, do they like to be isolated in the middle of nowhere with their felt pens and their clay models? Well, this is the HQ of Ford's brand new elite design team, and it's based in Soho, in central London. This Richard Rogers building is home to Ingenie and brings together the cream of Ford's design teams from around the world in one building. Just think of the brands under the Ford banner. Jaguar, Volvo, Land Rover, Aston Martin. All the top designers now work together to aid creativity and efficiencies for the future. Ingenie was conceived about two years ago as a uh, design think tank uh, slash brand center slash design group uh, and probably all three of those uh, explanations don't really cut to the core of, of what we're doing here. 
this place is really about uh, design as communication. And I always say design is about communicating with our customers or, or people at every point of contact with those, with those customers. If you look at uh, what we do, uh, it's really taking what is started in the studio with the automobile and extending it on out into every other point of contact with the customer. So we're thinking about the uh, environment that the customer, customer might buy the car in, we're thinking about the, the products that might have some relationship to the brand that the customer's interested in. We're thinking about every point of contact that has something positive to say about the individual brands. And so in Genie, although I suppose it was my idea to come, come to London, is, is a product of the cum cumulative mindset of really all of our design directors within each of the individual brands that make up the Ford Motor Company design community. The Ingenie design teams don't just work on cars. Merchandising is very important to all car companies. And here, branded goods are selected, tweaked or completely redesigned before appearing in the catalogues. But if it's cool cars you want to see, how about this Ford Street Car, which is a new Roadster variant on the Ford Car Super Mini. This should be on sale in 2003 in the UK. Nice! So the idea's a good one. Get the creative talents out of each individual car company with their inertia and internal politics and get them all to do their thing under one roof. Will it be successful? We'll have to wait until the next few motor shows to see what concepts these talented people come up with. That's all for this week's programme. On the next edition of Concept Cars, we look at this fragile planet. And with the world's oil running out, we look at the concept cars that are designed to run on alternative fuels. So, join us then.